Hello, everyone. I think we have been given the tough job to go through the last panel discussion just before drinks and dinner. So I hope it's entertaining and informative for everyone. Uh, I'm going to go straight to the point. Um, interesting topic we have today. As far as I remember, not that I was born in that era, but Web 1.0 was all about reading, right? Static websites, I could read up. Web 2.0 was read and write. I could read, I could create content, engage with users. Web 3.0, on the other hand, is about read, write, and own. I can own the content. I can literally own everything that I can create. Decentralized, there is ownership. My first question, and that's for all of you all, what has led to this new digital economy, that's how we call it, and why is it necessary? Why Web3 is considered necessary? So anybody. Can I go? Firstly, Hiru, thank you for, you know, in public moving away from me. It's the reaction I have for most women. So thank you for being consistent. But I think, uh, you know, I think we've been living a bit of a lie, actually, when you speak of Web 2.0 as interaction. We thought we were interacting with other people. The truth is we were interacting with what other people were making as content or their perspective and offering. So we weren't really interacting with them as much as we were interacting with their opinions, if you see what I mean. And as a result of that, Web 2.0, though it is, you know, much lauded and charming and all of that and hyped by all marketers, as it should be, uh, is actually not truly an interactive, and to borrow a word that Anita just invented this evening, immersiveness. It's not as immersive as it perhaps purports to be. And I think what necessitates Web 3.0 in all that it promises, and Rob did a great job of outlining its, its potential, is that that ability to interact when you start layering it with things like haptic control, touch and feel, tactile, sensorial, makes it a truer interactive experience. The experiences that we've been calling interactive aren't exactly interactive. So that would be my first premise in terms of why it's necessary. Um, so when we uh, saying that why we need it. So when we say web 1.0, I think Tim Berner doesn't know that where we reach by this day, who's the person who invented this entire thing. And uh, when we say today, we saying that we are in 2.0, but are we really using 2.0 very well? And uh, recently I was traveling to uh, some African continent and I wanted to uh, activate my roaming. I tried with, tried with my app, it's not happening. I went to their website, it's not happening. I, I spent close to 20 minutes chatting on their bot on the website, it's not happening. Then I called to their customer care. It took close to 30 minutes to get this activated. So we say that we are already in 2.0, but we're still not utilizing that. And then we say that we want to move into 2. Point, uh, I say web 3.0, are we going to utilize that? So. When we say there's a huge scope that why we need it, because still our communications, our interactions with the consumer are not integrated, right? We need to integrate that. We need to improve those experiences of the consumer. And I say security. In these days, if you see most of the organizations, they have their own data. E-commerce, if we talk about Amazon having their own, Meta is having their own, all the banks having all the data which consumers data. But when this decentralization happens, you are owning your own data, which is the most important thing, right? We reading news every day, this data on, on, on sale by some, somebody online and people can buy it, right? Utilize it. So this is very important and why we need this so that we move into a space which is secure, secure safe, and where we can offer a huge engagement, I say, to the consumer in a personalized way, which is tailored for Sunil, let's say. So that is the reason that we need this. Rob, you want to add anything? Yeah, I guess, um, well, firstly, I remember 1.0 where I had to dial up to the internet access. <laughs> so I think that makes me feel very old. So thank you. Um, I, would, I would use a quote to, to, to say this. Um, there's a, a US poet philosopher, a lady called Maya Angelou. And one of her favorite quotes, my favorite quotes that she has is, people don't remember what you say or what you do. They remember how you make them feel. And so, I think the pursuit of with the Web3 technologies and the experiences, whether that's metaverse or the, <clears throat> the generative AI, all of these things are just the evolution of us searching for that better experience. We care about experiences. When we watch a movie in a movie theater, it's an experience. When we watch a show on television, it's an experience. When we listen to a song, it creates emotion inside us. 
So, and when we, when we shop, when we transact, there's an experience. Why do we buy branded goods? Because it makes us feel a certain way. So what we're doing with the next generation of technologies, we're just enabling a better and richer experience. You know, to your point about, um, we talk about uh, sort of the high-speed data access on mobile, just mobile kind of connection. I can sometimes get worse connections in US cities than I do here in, in Bombay. So, you know, I, I need that seamless connection, that seamless experience. And I think when we pursue haptic and when we pursue, you know, immersive worlds, what we're trying to do is get a richer experience to stimulate the, the kind of human spirit. But the good news of all of that is despite the incredible technology that's being developed, it's still a very human spirit we're pursuing. So, to great experiences, uh, you can continue holding on to the mic because my next question is for you, Rob. Um, Technology and consumer behavior go hand in hand. Changes in technology lead to change in consumer behavior and vice versa. Uh, what according to you, how Web3 will influence the consumer mindset? Yeah, that's a little bit of a chicken and egg argument, that one. <laughs> um, it's, it's a little bit of both. So, um, you know that audiences are crazy for IPL here. But before you created the IPL, there wasn't anything, there was a different kind of craziness for previous kind of cricket tournaments, right? So sometimes you have to push a little bit forward. I mean, one of the things about consumer behaviors that's always interesting is art imitates reality, you know, and, and so some of the technology jumps we have here were pictured in movies several years ago. I mean, look, the, even the name, you know, Metaverse comes from a book that was in 1992, you know, yeah. So, so the vision precedes it, and so consumers desire it, and if they desire it, some people build it. But sometimes you build something and it has an impact you didn't know. And so I think the consumer behaviors, that it's the same desire, the desire to connect with each other, the desire to be entertained, the desire to escape, the desire to transact, to feel good about what you bought, to value things, to, to have a value equation. Those desires are still the same, but how they manifest is, is, is changing. And so uh, I think it was Abik was saying earlier that, you know, it doesn't carry a wallet anymore. Um, you know, the same thing happens in some other markets. Like if you, for example, if you go to China, you can't actually pay with cash. You have to do the washing up if you don't have your, you know, your digital payments. So, so I think the idea is, you know, um, the behaviors change and we get used to those new behaviors. But I think the aspiration driving it doesn't, doesn't. Doesn't change. So you're saying consumers are looking for more convenient experiences? Is that what you're trying to nudge at? And thus, use of technology? Not, not just convenient. They're looking for convenience is one of those things. They're looking for greater value. They're looking for experiences they may not be able to get. So one of the things that the meta, an example of that, you know, the metaverse would do is, let's say you can't afford to travel right now, but you want to escape your current circumstance. Maybe you can immerse yourself in experience and escape whole bunch of pros and cons on that, and I'm sure we'll, maybe we'll get to that later. Um, but there's also things, it's not just convenience, and I think this is what Adrian and I were having a quick chat about earlier. We talk a lot about the direct-to-consumer impact of Web3 technologies and, and the metaverse because that's the cool, fun, exciting area of it. But actually, 5G and, and Web3 infrastructure is going to change B2B businesses. I know it's slightly less cool, but it's really important of how it frees up um, people's time, people's focus, and the, the, the resources to do other incredible things. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Sunil, next. Uh, we spoke about immersive, experiential experiences for consumer. You know, that's what Web3 would do. How do you think uh, advertising industry will adapt to take advantage of this? Uh, I think there is no way out that we don't want this. We have to. We have to force to do this. But uh, I believe there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, so I believe when technology comes into play, there are advantages and there are disadvantages. So let's talk about advantage first, that when we adapt this entire piece, we started using or creating products which are semantic in language, understand better than what your search engines or social media understand these days. Most of the chatbots still pick your keywords, provide you solutions, rather than understanding all the sentences, what they are, right? So we need to improvise there, yes, and further building on this entire piece. So it it's represent a whole new arena for us. We still say that we are personalizing, but we're using cookies, and cookies are common 
that these are 10,000 people who shop on Vintra, these are 50,000 people shop on Amazon, right, using iPhone, using Samsung. But we still do not personalize that what a person wants, it's a chicken or egg, right. So I think we, we all need to move into that direction, but when we want to move it, we need to be prepared. And, and we, as we do this more regularly for each consumer, I think we're going to create a huge, uh, I say great experience of consumer and they stick to it. But when we talk about disadvantage, we all using cookies these days, you know all the browsers are having, even the website you go, they ask for accept our cookies and we do it blindly. And then what they do, they utilize our data, they ut utilize our buying behavior, our, our browsing pattern and everything and then start bombarding ads. I still receive more than 50% of which ads which are not targeted to me, right? So once this, this entire piece come in, your cookies will go away. So we need to find the different ways that how we stitch together the entire communications which is more personalized, more experience driven and this is going to give us a lot of benefit when this goes very directly to your consumer so you're not spending any money which is not utilized. So in these days if you say I'm advertising on Facebook even though I has a very sharp targeting still your 50% of ad not seen by consumer who are your target audience. So I think that will go away and we'll have all get a better ROI of our money or of our advertisers who are spending, our, our clients are spending. So that, that's this entire thing will be, will be bring in by Web 3.0. So on that note, Adrian, if uh, Sunil says that it's a must to adapt Web 3, maybe now or in future, a matter of time, um, you know, there's a perception that, uh, you know, there is no long-term uh, valuable uh, impact of Web3, you know, it's, it's flivorous, it's short term, you just hop on as a first mover and there's nothing more to it. So how does one as a marketer create a meaningful, valuable, sustainable, Im you know, impact using Web3? Yeah, I think the answer, I mean, for all the skeptics of Web3, you know, they should be the skeptics of Web2 and those guys should be the web skeptics of Web1, right? <laughs> because I think that will be a lesson in history well worth learning and it, I, I'll give you an example of why that's necessary to do and, and why it, it provides value to customers. So Sunil spoke about, talk, you took some exotic trip to Africa, did you, and you had, I, I was traveling to Borivli the other day and, you know, connectivity was bad and just by show of hands, you can ask the audience here, uh, who over here is really satisfied with their mobile network? Like really, like you'd give it a 10 on 10, would you put up your hand? All right, now look at all of us greedy people, first we had whatever came before 3G, 2G, and we were not happy, we got 3G, and we're not happy with 3G, now we want 5G. Like Gillette shaving blades, they'll keep adding Gs, right? And we'll be unhappy. And I think that behavior and that phenomenon itself is representative of the fact of what, you know, statisticians will call the Kano model, which is our needs and our wants keep ratcheting up. So the adaptiveness of marketing, back to your question, to provide value. What does Web 3.0 provide? I mean, I think as Rob quite eloquently put it, and what I derive from what he was saying so insightfully, in fact, when we were speaking earlier, that's what I promised him. I take whatever he said earlier and then use it to sound smart. That's why I cornered him. Time, distance, and space. These are the three elements that cause a lot of effortfulness for consumers, right? The time it takes to go to a store to just to try something or browse through an app and you feel nauseous because you're going through their carousel and gallery. The distance with which you have to travel to return something or even if it's, you know, uh, going and exploring a new space and trying out something in, in retail. Uh, and the fact is that, you know, in, in, in urban dwellings, you don't really have the spaces that you want to go to. You look around here, you look around any area, public spaces are shrinking because some smart developer is working with some smart uh, government body to change the regulations and, and consume that public space. So if you look at Web 3.0, it actually provides you all of that, while at the same time dramatically reducing the cost for marketers to do that. Right? The cost of infrastructure is low, the cost of changing what consumers don't like is low. And you're able to remove a lot of effortfulness both for the marketer and the brand as well as the consumer. So you actually have revenue opportunities growing but cost opportunities declining. And I think that dramatic divergence is what makes the case for marketing and adds value. More than all the um, sexy stuff that, that, that Rob showed us including his very, very fit avatar which looks like a Marvel hero. <laughs> Uh, which I, I told him was quite unfair, actually, and not representative of the truth, Rob. <laughs> Rob, do you want to add something to that? 
that that last last week curve he's cut deep i think <laughs> well i'll move to sunil in that case um sunil uh, i mean rob said that earlier as well that web3 is an ecosystem that will impact industries you know to name a few gaming and social media these are of course connected uh, industries that it will impact could you throw light on what do you think about it and how would it impact so i will pick up one or two industries not all because i think we need to end the session everybody is waiting for their wine and beer so uh, if you take a gaming an example gaming is all about experience and excitement so when you know that you have a metaverse of the things where you can make your experience much larger than life what you looking at right now we know that we going to have more people coming into it apart from that how gamers making these days money that you buy your lives within the game and you are but using this nfts which is coming into the picture you create tokens you create many other things within the game so that will create a lot of revenue opportunities for them and then when they leave this game if they have those money this money is not sticking with this game you can move those monies to anywhere anywhere and any other games you're playing right so your money is not got stuck anywhere the money is moving from here one place to another place and it's moving in such a way that nobody knows how it's moving your entire data is secure which is another concern which everybody has so this is a new revenues avenues i say will be increased for gaming similarly when we talk about let's say market places or let's say online shopping we are the country i know from the fact that i come from this entire digital industry before 5 year we are the country 80% cod 20% online now we are 80% online 20% cod right so the trust is building but when we have this technology into place the trust will go further and then your online shopping your online payments which has already gone up a level high will further increase and create other revenues for us so these are the two industries i want to pick up right my next question is to both rob and ajin what do you think will what will create obstacles to the new to the growth of the new digital economy i mean one is bandwidth like nobody kind of raised their or rather everybody raised their hands up saying that they have a bandwidth issue do you think we are ready for web3 are there more obstacles besides of course there's 5g coming for sure but what are the obstacles that you foresee that would kind of you know impact the growth of So so Robin I actually discussed specifically this point and you know it's interesting you asked a question about infrastructure you go to any panel discussion whether it's about the budget or web 3.0 if you say infrastructure everybody thinks you're saying something smart I don't think it's about infrastructure at all the infrastructure in this case with 5G on the horizon and and you know things like quantum computing your infrastructure will be less of a problem I think the problem will be if people like Rob me and and Sunil adopt the mumbo jumbo of the metaverse and start talking hash functions decentralized did ondc and this alphabet soup the more intimidating you make a new technology intellectually the less likely it is to get adopted i mean that's a well worn truth rob your your point of view so I, i agree with you that i don't think it's infrastructure because i think that's the technology has been and be, is being built and being deployed and rolled out so that's just a matter of time I think one of the interesting lessons and and the meta the metaverse is not exactly the only manifestation of the web3 but just exactly. to use as an example engagement in metaverse spaces is higher in games where there was a pre-established audience that was there for a reason and they have pre-established mechanisms the gamification so we now use gamification not just in games but we use gamification in learning you know scoreboards and and reward systems that the play to the psychology of a of a, a a consumer so games when you put a metaverse experience in a mode of experience you're expanding on an existing audience you're giving them a reason to be there there's some amazing technology in decentraland and and uh, sandbox but there's not as much engagement because there's nothing to really draw you in as much you know so i was being asked some questions outside about IPL and i come back to IPL but you know that's a reason to get people into an experience and so don't forget we should never forget the traditional you know ways of building audiences and connecting people and creating some value and that's the biggest challenge is people build because they can but that's like you know i i build a house because i can but the, you know what if i don't want to live there and you know so we, i i think we need to go back to the basics of let's make it fun and engaging and 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 give a reason for doing that and that will remove the barrier but if we don't do that if we just get caught up in the the hype and the mumbo jumbo and there is a hype curve every new technology has that hype curve and following the hype curve comes the disillusionment but disillusionment is not the end of the story so some people are in the disillusionment now we just need to move to the okay we've learned a lot 
Now, what, what makes this really exciting and valuable, and how do we get back to the basics of doing that? But there's, there's one other thing here. It's, it's not so much engagement. I think we're getting a bit lost in the weeds over here, right? The real incentive, I, Sunil touched on this, but he spoke of it from the marketer's point of view. Like, again, if you would just ask any of us, right, what is the probability that your salary will increase 300% next year? Other than Anita, anyone? <laughs> so I was sitting next to Anita before the panel discussion, and two, two notifications popped up. I, couldn't, I wasn't invading her privacy, but I couldn't help see her phone, right? One was Fiorenza Ladies Group. So obviously she wants to interact with real people in, in her building. But the other was Wazirx, which as I understand is probably a banned cryptocurrency thing. But you know, the fact that cryptocurrency gives you the minimalist possibility that you could convert your net worth into 10, 20x. The fact that some goofy art that you create becomes a revenue stream. I mean, we've seen a foreshadowing of it in the digital creator economy, right? No other mechanism today provides people avenues for income that is based purely on their creativity to this extent, in the combination that it is. I'm not talking of creators and influencers now. This takes it to another level, whether it is your own data, where you can monetize it by offering it in exchange for goods uh, and services, whether it is some art you create, whether it is something you, you know, UGC as we used to call it, you create for a brand that you can now track and trace to see how a brand is using it, even if you're not a celebrity, or whether it's investing in fractionally in crypto. These are all revenue opportunities that the lay person uh, or even the salaried person has been robbed of. I mean, these have been exotic ways of making wealth and money that have belonged only to the informed or people in Silicon Valley um, uh, who take hormone therapy and things like that. I think Web 3.0 offers everyone that opportunity. And I think that's what makes it uh, an accelerant to the economy, not just marketers using it. Before I move to the next question, congratulations, Anita, on your 300x increase. <laughs> but uh, moving on, Rob, uh, while we speak of the benefits of Web 3, what about the ethical or the human cost associated with Web 3 experiences? I mean, there are some experiences internationally, it's been, you know, where uh, uh, I don't think it's been a pleasant experience using Web3, or it's misused to a certain extent. Um, how do you kind of tackle that? That's a huge topic that whole forums, multi-day forums are held on. Um, <laughs> so I think there is, the good news is there's a lot more discussion about the ethics of AI. And, you know, I think when Web 2.0 was being de developed and launched, I think there wasn't as much conversation about it. I think it was let's just get this thing up because it's kind of really cool. Um, I think now there's a lot of conversation. I've, I'll give you my one personal experience was I was trying out ChatGPT, you know, the first time I got it, I thought this is cool, I'll ask some difficult questions. I said, um, help me write an email to my 12 year old son to convince him it's a good idea to do his homework. <laughs> um, and so I wrote this and came back with a very eloquent answer, a bit, bit less emotive than I would have been, but it ended with love mum. We, we are in a gender fluid world, Rob, so if there's something you want to share with us, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you may as well do it now. Ex exactly. I know, and I'm not embarrassed to be called mum. That's okay. But I just, uh, it kind of flags one of the issues that, you know, we're using a lot of AI tools that have been trained in the biased world that we've all grown up in. And so if we want to make a better world, we have to be able to address some of those concerns. I think there's an awareness and discussion. We haven't cracked that part at all. I think we haven't decided what safety in the metaverse looks like and... You know, there's a lot of conversation about that, which is great. <clears throat> um, maybe it's not universally discussed, but there's a lot of groups looking at the ethics of AI and what does it mean. Um, I've had a conversation with uh, the Ministry of Communications in Singapore before when we were talking about let's push, you know, aggressively into reskilling and driving towards this, this AI. And I, my question was, what do you do with all the people that are currently working in the jobs that are going to be replaced? And so it's not that, oh, don't worry, we've always replaced them in the past. Okay, well what are you going to replace them with and how are you going to enable that? So I think there's still a lot of these points to discuss. The good news is there's a lot more partnership between governments and enterprises and experts and institutions to try to think about and have that conversation. You know, to have Digital India as a mandate and consistently being pushed forward wouldn't have happened 20 years ago, not just here, but in a lot of places. And so the fact that people are having that conversation is great. I don't think we have the answers yet, and we do have to try and address as we go along, but there's a lot of things there. I think, I think this question, Hiro, actually is a, very, is a very potent answer to the question you asked earlier in terms of what the obstacles would be. You know, in, as Rob said, in Web 2.0, we had a pass. It just came on, and now we're dealing with the aftermath afterwards. 
but if you've seen how all the tech overlords that were earlier sort of praised and uh, even prayed to have now fallen, I, I think, and have feet of clay, it is because they hadn't thought through the ethics of it. And I think if there's one obstacle that will, will come in the way is the, the unsavory experiences that are possible uh, that Rob and you both alluded to will prevent big brands that hold their brand their reputation very sacred from participating until all of that is sorted out. So it, it's not just a issue of virtue or justice or ethics or morals. It's really a question of if this isn't sorted out at the beginning, there will be much less brand participation than there was in Web 2.0, which could then effectively either delay or at least destabilize the adoption of Web 3.0. That, that would be my... And I, I just add one build on top of that. I don't think all brands are going for the in or out conversation. Mm. What is quite encouraging, you saw in a number of the examples I gave, brands are weaving in sustainability aspects into their participation. I think it's going to be important. Some brands say, I'm going to, I'm going to wait and see if it gets better. Other brands are saying, I'm going to be part of solving that. Mm. You know, I'm going to be part of defining that more positive future. And that takes a bit of courage. And not, not every brand will be in a place or, or have the desire to do that. But some brands are stepping up because the role of brands in society is becoming more important, not just a nominal tick in, in published reports, but is a genuinely, if you're going to attract the next generation, the role of purpose in hiring talent is absolutely key these days. So I, so I think there's, there's a chance, not everyone will do the same, but I think there's a chance that, and this is one of those opportunities of, okay, if we're going to do it, maybe brands can be part of doing it right this time. I agree to that. I think there are, I, I think we should speak more about it and of course then take steps. I know recently OpenAI announced that, you know, they are going to flag out uh, videos or information or any content created by AI because right now it's so difficult to differentiate between what's an AI video, what's a real right. video, right. you know. So just before I move to the next so section. I think I will add on to this, what, what we're saying that, that the, we need to have a partnership with the government but if you look at the, the pace we are, although the government is doing a lot of initiative, but if you look at e-pharmacies in India, they came like seven, eight years yeah, now, yeah. but their Still last the final policy came in 12 January. Mm. Right? So, so we are working at that speed. So, and it's a human nature, if you do something notable, we say, okay, let's everybody do it. And I'm, I've seen this one feed of my LinkedIn there, where one hospital from Hyderabad saying that now we have used Metaverse. I said, really? I'm not going and doing shopping in a Metaverse, and you saying that you come in my hospital in a Metaverse and do whatever you want to do. So I think it's a lot of choices that brand needs to evolve or analyze that what they're getting into, how this is going to help, what are the ethics, what are the, the compliance policies at a company level rather than, rather than going at a government level. And if you think within first, I think we know that what we're doing and we can secure from that perspective. Can I just add, you've triggered one other thing that the, actually at Densi we've spent a lot of time. Um, getting, making decisions of brand representation in Metaverse and, and on Web3 platforms is not just the job of the CMOs and the marketing function. It's critical to align the finance functions and the legal functions and rights management. It needs to be an aligned approach because otherwise you really are exposing yourself to risks and... and so before I move to the next set of fun questions, uh, my... These, one were, of, these were also fun, Hiro. Yeah, is it? It will get better. Great. So my next question, and I think I, uh, that's for all, if you had to maybe mention just one or two points, what do you think the marketers then should do or shouldn't do with Web3? You know, just a point to each one of you. Yeah, I, th I think the way we look at it and the way we encourage our group companies to do is yeah, really to, to don't inter intellectualize it, but experiment with it. Right? Sort of do and, and find out and do and learn. The other is when you're trying to sell this in, and I'm now talking about the real adoption of it, the old adage of show, don't tell still operates. Show the example. I think, you know, Rob, some of the examples you showed were people making perhaps clumsy initial steps, but at least showing consumers and their own stakeholders what can happen. And I think the great opportunity for, for, for marketers and their consumers right now with Web 3.0 is that they can truly co-opt them, right? Truly co-create. I know these have been buzzwords in the past where, you know, marketers you do whatever they want to do and say, no, we co-created, we co-opted. No, you haven't, right? It hasn't been the customer leading you and creating things. I think so far you've actually been communicating to them rather than co-opting them. And I think that's what marketers really now have an opportunity to do without the restriction of, as I said, time, distance, and space. Right? The, the, the focus group of your 
is suddenly envisioned and, and completely liberated from the focus group room. If you think about one simple unit of how we were gathering consumer insight and believing that we were co-creating with consumers. Today, you're not confined by that physical space. And I think the leaps that you can take in so far as understanding new consumers and not just creating products and communication, but creating new consumers for what you offer is tremendous. And I think that is the true unleashing power of Web 3.0. What you should not do is you need to have a clarity first, what you want to do for your brand, for your company. And uh, I think this clarity is still not there with a lot of people. I'm not saying I'm smart, even I don't have because if you look at everybody wanted to get on born chatbots, which where we know 50% that doesn't work, right? And then you're getting into something which is completely new, not evolved yet completely. So we need to define what we really want to do. So if you ask me that, if I have to start today, where I would start today? So most of the brands you see, they have their own websites and there are a lot of, let's say millions of consumers coming to brand websites, they even not an e-commerce website. So if you're not doing an e-commerce, why don't you create that brand website to an experience website? So you just give an experience to the consumer, provide more information, don't sell a brand, send, sell your information to the consumer about what they're looking for. Start from there. So start slow and then gradually when you know you are sure, internally testing it, like they didn't say that small test, Keep doing it. Once you see it's successful, pilot, doing well, secure, tested, then you go big and see what you can do. But it has to start slow and then pick up accordingly. It's not that everybody is doing, I want to jump in and do that and then ultimately you realize you already lost millions of dollars into that. Rob, anything? It's a, it's a little bit similar to that. I was going to say, the most important thing is to understand why. Why, why do you want to do this at all? I mean, what, what are you... What are you trying to achieve? You know, and so Heineken was kind of clear. They weren't trying to look for a measurable marketing ROI for that experiment. It was PR buzz for a new brand, which was pre-marketing launch. So I think they had an objective that may not have achieved a marketing objective if you wanted to do brand build, but it was a PR attention specific metric. And so if you want to experiment and learn, then go with the mindset of experiment and learn. You know, if you really think it's a brand build, then you need to go with a commitment to a brand build. You wouldn't like put a couple of spots on a on a prime time show and go, "That's it, I'm done branding now." You know, so to understanding what, why you, why you're doing this at all? Is it FOMO? Are you just scared you're missing out on a cool thing? You know, so I think understanding why you want to do this and what you hope to achieve is really important before you make decisions on what you do and where you do it and how you do it. So it's, I think if you can nail that part, and it's, it's not always easy because there's a lot of noise and, as you said, a lot of noise, a lot of cool language and <laughs> cool experimentation. And it's like, well, okay, what am I really trying to achieve here? Great. So you can't have a Web3 conference and not have AI asking questions, right? Oh God. I mean, I'm just physically present here. So what I did was I said that if chat GPT had to moderate this panel discussion, what are the questions they would an AI would ask you. And it's very simple. You can just pick the placards up there and you can answer in yes and no. It's like a rapid fire with AI. Right, right. And uh, I have literally taken some 10 questions that they, the AI wanted to ask you. Um, and you have to answer it as either yes or no. There's no maybe, no gray areas. Are you ready? It's like a rapid fire, okay? Um, are uh, immersive technologies like AR and VR the future of brand experiences? Is AI transforming the marketing industry? Is the metaverse the next frontier for brand activation? Are virtual events the future of product launches? <laughs> it also depends on the COVID or any other things that they come up, then you don't have the Will AI be the next influencer on social media? Yes, no? Okay. Are you planning to explore opportunities in the Web3 space? Can AI write better copy than a human? I think AI is insecure. No. <laughs> is the use of NFTs becoming more mainstream in marketing strategies? 
Does your brand have any plans to leverage metaverse technology for immersive experiences? Have you looked into using artificial intelligence for personalizing customer experiences? And I don't know why this question has just popped up. Do you like the moderator of the panel discussion? No. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Thank you for being such a spot.